one of the more interesting things is that even the adolescent child, him or herself, will say the relationship with the parent is better, closer to a 10 on a zero to 10 scale, with 10 being the most loving, supportive relationship they can imagine. When they lose conflicts with their parent, yeah. I think that's something that you know every parent <laughs> needs to keep in mind, that it may seem in the short term that to have a high-quality relationship with your kid, you have to let them win. You have to give in to the, their demands, mm -hmm. uh, regardless of what they are, or even when they break the rules and expectations that that you've thoughtfully set for yourself in, in conjunction with your spouse or partner. Mm -hmm. But it turns out that doing so uh, jeopardizes the long-term development and health of of that child, and and they themselves even you know recognize that maybe sure. probably not consciously, but they recognize that something's amiss in the mm -hmm. relationship when when they're allowed when they don't have that container, that limit setting that keeps them uh, on track. Hey, Jonathan. Hello, Frank. How are you? Very well, thanks. So let me get something straight when I introduce you, which I will in a moment. Um, when it says Gallup's principal economist, uh, do you go to work? Do you work out of your place are you teaching because you're a phd as well so i couldn't i've been reading all about you but i can't figure out whether you do a whole bunch of things or gallup is your employer or how's that work yeah gallup's my employer yeah so i i do go into the office from time i work mostly work from home though since since 2020 yeah uh, as that became um an option yeah and i have three children so it's easier how old, just to... how old are the kids they, they range in age from three to 11. And then I've got another one that will be due uh, in a couple of months. So uh, are you counting the third? Is that the third or you, is that a fourth? That would be fourth. Yeah. That's great. Well, no wonder you have so much child centric, how kids are getting raised, who's doing what with all your, your studies. This is kind of, you know, it's not just academic for you. That's right. I've got many opportunities to apply the yeah. lessons to my everyday life. So when you started studying parenting, is that when you also began to have your own children or is that just coincidental that you've been doing? I'd that? say it goes back further because before I studied economics, I studied psychology mm. and I uh, got my bachelor's degree in psychology mm. with science focus, but went into clinical psychology and started a PhD program yeah. in, in that field. And Leading up to that and during that time, I worked mm. with adolescents and adults who are suffering from mental health problems and inpatient and clinical settings and, and yeah. some outpatient work as well. And I, I saw the, the powerful impact of traumatic experiences as well as mm. problematic relationships with parents and caretakers. Yeah. Well, let me introduce you properly. Yeah. And let these, me introduce you yeah, and, sure. then, and then we'll get into it. Um, this is Frank okay. Schaefer, and you are listening to and or watching In Conversation with Frank Schaefer, which is a Facebook Live event, then goes to YouTube in many places, and then becomes a podcast and goes to all those places podcasts go to. And today I'm talking with uh, Jonathan Rothwell. I'm saying your last name right. Second Rothwell. Time. Rothwell. Yes, Rothwell. And Jonathan is uh, Gallup's principal economist. Um, non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and a visiting scholar at George Washington University. And just before we started all this, um, Jonathan and I were chatting and Jonathan has three children and a fourth on the way. And as anybody who watches this podcast and listens to my commentaries, um, it has to be said, or as part of our book club, it has to be read and all those things knows that we have a big focus on family dynamics, parenting, politics as it impacts that. And I think, Jonathan, I first ran into your work as being quoted in or even articles by you on things to do with family, parenting, the quality of parenting, what sort of backgrounds are giving children of various ages the best start or the worst problems. And let me, you know, there's so many places we could go with this, but let me just start with one that I read fairly recently where you were being quoted that Gallup did a study, which I'll ask you to unfold and explain, that um, found that actually if you had to pick a type of home in which children are doing best in terms of all kinds of issues, which I'll have you explain, 
you could loosely describe that as a conservative home, uh, an intact home, two parents and so forth. And you did a, a, a statistical study on this, not an ideological study, but then I'm guessing that it's been quoted with some fear and trembling in certain liberal circles. I don't know whether I read the, the quote in the New York Times and how they treated it. I'm guessing it's also picked up in more conservative circles as a kind of, hey, we told you so. So why don't you start by describing that particular study, when you did it, how you did it, where it's been referenced and written about, and then maybe if you can remember and I forget to double back and talk about how it's been received in the context of our sort of never ending culture war and everything being put in these little ideological bubbles and so forth, which, by the way, in this particular podcast, in conversation with Frank Schaefer, we push back very hard mm. against that. So one day, I, a couple of weeks ago, I interviewed the editor of The Wall Street Journal and who had been the editor of the 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 Financial Times. Another time we will be talking to a transgender author who's written about her experiences. And we really try to go to where people are doing things we find interesting, not, hey, we'll only talk to people we agree with who say things that fit a particular ideology. So I just want you to know that. And that's why I'm fishing for how this is. Mm -hmm. Sorry about the long intro, but why don't you tell <laughs> us about that study and what it was called? Well, that's a great mission. And I'm glad to be on the program. So we did a survey that we launched in June of July of 2023, we being Gallup, my employer, and I'm calling it the, the Gallup Study on Familial and Adolescent Health. Hmm. And I conceived of this project in early 2023, and it was motivated by several things. One was the growing sense that we're in the midst of an adolescent mental health crisis. Mm -hmm. Many people will have heard of rising suicide rates and drug overdoses among middle-aged Americans uh, called Deaths of Despair by the economists Anne Case and Angus Deaton, their uh, profound mm -hmm. work. Uh, I think it's a little bit less known, but it's becoming more known that uh, suicide rates are rising just as rapidly over the last 10 to 15 years and among U.S. adolescents. Yeah. And all there's other signs of mental health problems are also increasing self-reported symptoms of anxiety and depression. There's been a lot of speculation as to what the causes of these things are. I'd be happy to, to discuss that in some more detail. Mm. But one of the ideas that occurred to me, uh, being a parent, as you mentioned, is that the, and also having some background in clinical psychology before I studied economics, that the role of parents is very important to the mm -hmm. uh, fundamental mental health and socialization of young people. And as it happens, there's a, a very strong, robust literature in the developmental psychology field going back to the 1950s, work from people like Eleanor McCovey, John Bowlby, who, who came up with the theory of attachment parenting, uh, Diana Baumride, who came up with the, the phrase authoritative parenting, all of which shows and has been replicated many, many times that uh, children raised by warm but discipline-oriented parents mm -hmm. tend to have the best social outcomes in terms of mental health and other things. And so I put 20 or so items on the survey that would ask parents about their parenting practices and style and and some other questions about the relationship quality they have with their with the child that was selected for them to think about for the survey and then if they had an adolescent child so we that's about 6000 parents that we were able to to interview through what we call the Gallup panel which mm -hmm. are people who've previously taken Gallup surveys through random selection and then we subsequently send them an email saying, would you like to participate in this study? And we mm -hmm. get very high response rates because we already have their email address. They've already taken a Gallup survey. They seem to, to like or appreciate uh, the kinds of surveys that we give them. Mm -hmm. And then if they had a child or living with a child, I should say, between the ages of 13 and 19, we invited them to, to, to give the sur a, new, a different survey uh, to that child. And most, of, most parents agreed to do so and the, and the children. Uh, often mm. took the took took the survey so that was about 1500 um, adolescents who who answer questions about the relationship they have with their parents yeah. as well as a bunch of other things you might want to ask adolescents when thinking mm -hmm. about their mental health such as how they're how they like school uh, the quality of their friendships how they spend their time how much time they spend on social media which turns out to be about five hours a day which is different topics but alarming enough yeah and um 
and you know, kind of putting that all together, we had a, a, a pretty robust index of their mental health combining answers from their parent and themselves yeah. and then and then and then measures of the quality of the relationship they have with the parent and the parenting practices that the parent mm -hmm. adopts and putting that all together explains quite a bit of the variation in in youth mental health mm. well you know i will approach this because there's so much to unpack little personal note here i'm the father of three grown children five grandchildren three of whom ages 15, 13, and 9 live across the street. When I finish this interview with you, I'll have about a half hour of downtime. Then I drive off to a school to pick up my 9-year-old granddaughter. I will then cook her a snack, or she will cook because we cook together in the afternoons. And my life for the last 15 years has revolved around this second bite at child care as a, now a 71-year-old who basically, you know, I had two different things during the day, and I'm enjoying my conversation with you. But my day that I take most seriously starts every afternoon at 3.15 when I run off to get this child. And I mention that because, you know, sometimes I discuss things on this podcast that I'm interested in. I never talk to anybody I'm not interested in. But today we're talking about where I live. And um, so this is like a highly personal and interesting topic to me. That said, what I want to ask you is this. One way to unpack your, what you've studied is that if you were in a private, unrecorded con conversation with someone you cared about and were doing your best for, who was a parent of a, of a child or children who were going to be teens or just kids in general, it, as a parent yourself, what have you taken away from all your studies where you would say, look, whatever else you do, don't do this. Here are the things to watch out for. Here are the positive things I've found that maybe are counterintuitive, that aren't part of what everyone's talking about, mm -hmm. facts that are too little mentioned. Um, you know, I really would like to go there in terms of just off the record, non-pollster, PhD academic that you are on a personal level, you're talking to your brother who's having some children and you're saying to him, look, everything I'm studying is showing me this. What is it? Fill in the blank. Great question. So there, I'd say there are two dimensions to parenting that, that stand out, that both of which are very important, but they're not necessarily related in the sense that if you're good on one dimension, you're, mm. you're not necessarily good on the other dimension. So the, the one that I think is probably the most intuitive is to be responsive to the needs of the child. And mm. that goes back, I think, the work of John Bowlby on attachment parenting it goes into some detail about what that looks like in infancy in the in the early years of toddlerdom, mm -hmm. and uh, there he argues that, that children have natural instincts to bond to the caregivers, and and they because they're so dependent when they come out of the womb, uh, they need a sense of security that a, a caregiver can provide in, in terms of providing food, security, everything else that the parents provide in those early years. And when that relationship goes well, the parent's responsive to the child's needs and the needs are being met on a, a fairly predictable basis uh, without uh, traumatic things happening and without you know, a great deal of uh, you know, difficulty. So that you could think of that as, as being extended through as the child ages by just being responsive to the child's reasonable demands. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, f for food, for entertainment, for for play and activity, for friendship, and so on. And parents who answer questions like "I hug my kid," I, I, I strongly agree that I hug and kiss my child every day on a one to five scale is is one way that we get it. The, that kind of thing. Uh, I share a warm, affectionate relationship with my child is another way that we we measure that sort of thing. Um, I feel relaxed and at ease with my child. We we joke and play. All those those sorts of things. And one directly is I respond to my child's needs, um, and, and prioritizing that is 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 associated with that dimension that's been measured across surveys for for decades. Uh, you, you, both using clinical work and 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 the kinds of surveys that that we do at Gallup, which are more broadly representative of national populations. So that's that's the warm responsive dimension. So you need to be good on that to be you know, an optimal parent. The, I think the, the less intuitive one 
and the more controversial one is mm. is the one that I, I I think you know bears mentioning, and that's the demandingness factor. Mm. And and there we see, I think, important cultural differences, political differences, ideological differences that emerge. Where uh, for whatever reason it just seems, and and Diana Baumwright speculated that this would be the case, that more conservative leaning parents are more comfortable with their own authority. Mm. They're more comfortable with the idea that. They're stronger, more powerful, more have more wisdom, have more make more reliable judgments, mm-hmm. and so they should be the ones to decide when the child goes to bed, when the child devotes their energy to homework and other productive activities, mm-hmm. when they're what they're allowed to do for play, what they can, what is considered safe and not safe, and they they still might be responding very much to the child's reasonable demands. But they set out rules and expectations that are clear, and they enforce them, and they punish mm-hmm. them when when the child doesn't meet those mm-hmm. expectations in, a, in an appropriate way. And they answer questions like, um, "I have I I have a hard time disciplining my child." They're they're more likely to strongly disagree with that statement mm-hmm. than 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 liberal parents, and. Uh, they're more likely to uh, agree with statements like "I set rules and expectations for my my child. Mm. Uh, my child has to meet my expectations before they're allowed to relax and play." Mm. Things along those lines. And when there's a conflict, my child wins is something that they're apt to strongly disagree with compared to mm. to liberal parents. So it turns out that all those things are also very very important to the the mental health of, mm. of children and, and adolescent children. And uh, I think one of the one of the more interesting things is that even the adolescent child, him or herself, will say the relationship with the parent is better, closer to a 10 on a zero to 10 scale, with 10 being mm. the most loving, supportive relationship they can imagine. When they lose conflicts with their parent, yeah. uh, if their parent says that they win in, the, in, in debates and conflicts, the child is actually happier with the parent. Mm-hmm. And so that's, I think that's something that you know every parent <laughs> needs to keep in mind, that it may seem in the short term that to have a high quality relationship with your kid, you have to let them win. You have to give in to the, their demands, mm-hmm. uh, regardless of what they are, or even when they break the rules and expectations that that you've thoughtfully set for yourself in, in conjunction with your spouse or partner. Mm-hmm. But it turns out that doing so uh, jeopardizes the long term development and health of of that child, and and they themselves even you know recognize that maybe sure. probably not consciously. But they recognize that something's amiss in the relationship when when they're allowed when they don't have that container that limit setting that keeps them uh, on track. Yeah, that that was interesting to me because I think I began to pick up on your name. I mean, obviously, Gallup is something I've read all sorts of studies from over the years, being someone who reads and studies. But I began to pay attention to who, uh, you know. Jonathan Rothwell is when I started seeing your name quoted as part of studies with kind of headlines saying conservative parents parenting is better than uh, liberal parenting or, you know, reported within a a thing. And so I'm very interested in that um, finding. And I and I'll go back to something I mentioned a little earlier in terms of just how within our polarized culture war context is this information been received and used because I think especially for the kind of people who watch In Conversation with Frank Schaefer, which is what um, we're doing right now, my podcast and so forth, um, I guess they would skew left. I would guess most of my people who follow me would be voting for Joe Biden in the next election and not for Donald Trump, um, to put it mildly. But that said, I think there's a lot of people who would describe themselves as liberal politically. But if you dig into their home and what they're doing with their children, they would also fit that bill in terms of um, loving and attached, but at the same time, understanding that boundaries actually serve a purpose and help kids. So I wonder if you think the terminology liberal conservative actually describes what's going on or whether it would be a more accurate way to, that doesn't sound like it's predicting who you would vote for, but more mm-hmm. comes to how you relate to people. I don't know. It just it, it just seems to me like something that you might have some thoughts on. Yeah, well, one could characterize it as a more traditional approach to parenting, uh, in insofar as we think of, and then uh, you know, there's not a lot of data on 
sure. on the parenting practices of of people in the you know, pre-modern era or even in the you know early to mid 20th century uh, the extensive research that was done starting around the 1950s was unfortunately usually not from nationally representative samples it was it was uh, parents at a particular school or yeah. uh, community and uh, so one sample was of uh, church members in in Utah, mm-hmm. and uh, and so you you wouldn't want to infer much in terms of you know sure how that measure in 1980 or 1970 uh, applies to the, to the general population. Um, but I think you know kind of intuitively, a lot of people sort of understand that their grandparents, great grandparents, tended to be you know, sort of stricter in their rules and expectations and norms. And there was mm-hmm. more of a, a, a culturally, I, th- I think there was a sense that demanding this and that demandingness side of, of parenting was, was stronger. Uh, there's obviously been a lot of changes in how we think about physical punishment and mm-hmm. discipline over, over the course of the 20th century, which I think a lot of people can, can relate to, but, you know, I, I, I'm not taking a stand on, on that issue. I mean, I, I, yeah. I don't, I don't think it's, a, I've sort of absorbed the modern sensibility that it's not appropriate to hit children. Um, yeah. And uh, I don't think that is what demandingness, you know, necessitates. There are plenty yeah, of ways to, to discipline about. and punishment. That's right. Yeah. But I think that uh, just having that sense of intergenerational respect and coherence where we we sort of have a positive view on 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 what our ancestors did mm-hmm. uh, at at some at some level and want to emulate the you know the some of their approaches to life whether it's uh, continuity with the religion that they might have have had or or their their parenting practices mm-hmm. that that seems to be more common among conservatives but it's yeah, certainly sure. there are certainly many liberals who uh, have the same religion as their parents or grandparents, and and go to church, and uh, and even if they're atheists, they they may still respect a lot of the you mm-hmm. know traditions that were passed on to them in terms of uh, respect for authority, respect for parents, and and try to convey those teachings to to their kids mm-hmm. in in ways that would be you know, per- perfectly. Uh, normal in a in a very religious conservative household. Hmm. So um, this is really just about identifying some some characteristics that we see in the data that that sure. make somebody a little bit more or a little bit less likely to adopt uh, some of those parenting strategies. Hmm. And I think one one of the fascinating things that that I emphasize in in, in sort of the write up of of this data is that there doesn't seem to be much of a class or race difference in in, <laughs> in these strategies. Uh, it's not the case that more educated parents are are more likely to adopt these sort of best practice strategies, yeah. or, or the other way around. And um, and as I as I say, one of the pieces there's no evidence that sort of wealth buys better relationships with your children or better parenting practices. Mm. Uh, there's a there's does seem to be some advantages in terms of exposure to what we call adverse experiences. So mm. the, the this is another aspect of parenting. It's not exactly parenting practices. Uh, but if a child is being raised in a situation where uh, one parent is struggling with drug or alcohol uh, addiction, or uh, a parent has been lost to death or moved out for some reason, or uh, the child feels rejected by a biological parent or abandoned, uh, those are those are experiences that directly negatively predict youth mental health that aren't necessarily related to these. Yeah, you know, whether you're warm, whether the other parent who's there is warm, demanding, and or or, or some other mm. combination, and those things do tend to be worse off among children with lower income uh, parents, or yeah. uh, and they, they tend to be concentrated in, and 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 more likely to be concentrated in black households than white households, for example. But those, but the overall relationship quality and the overall parenting practices are not, mm. and so it really does seem to be something that. That really anybody can adopt, and there's no you know, socio-economic barrier to it. Yeah, I find it very interesting. Let me reintroduce you. Um, you're listening to or watching in conversation with Frank Schaefer. I'm Frank Schaefer, and my guest today is Jonathan Rothwell. And Jonathan is Gallup's principal economist, a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, visiting scholar at George Washington University, and uh, I mentioned that. Um, 
please subscribe to this in conversation with Frank Schaefer on Apple Podcasts and also um, pay a little bit of attention to my Substack channel. It has to be said at frankschaefer.substack.com where I hold forth and make little commentaries um, that go on various social media platforms, which brings me to the whole social media question. You know, one of the things that is implied in the studies that you've done that I've been reading to to prepare for this conversation um, is that there is such a thing as a mental health crisis looming in our younger population. Um, we look to blame people too quickly for things. There's a lot of things going on, but it seems to me inescapable that... Um, Part of this is what has happened in social media with our tech bros and the kind of way the algorithms have been set up to make it deliberately addictive, aimed at young people, let alone the actual child abuse in terms of pedophiles and others using this sort of dramatic headline stuff, but just the the constant use of phones. Uh, you know, I'm 71, obviously, I have a very different background, but I think it gets into all sorts of areas. For instance, I'm going to be interviewing Brad Wilcox, who's written this new book called Get Married, which comes out in two weeks. And the studies that he's got in that book actually mirror a lot of what you're doing in terms of the quality of conservative parenting, conservative not being a political stance, but what you're talking about, the combination of affection and attachment at the same time, some discipline and some codes. The, the detrimental effect of single parenting, which has been danced around by all kinds of people because it's hard to face, but it's come up. The different inequality in care between kids who are put in daycare situations very young and those who have a parent with them. Um, further involvement of fathers in parenting in various relationships, kind of mirroring what I do as a grandfather doing child care. I was there in the 70s, a fly on the wall in all the political discussions. It seems to me there was a kind of a faux feminism. I am a feminist, but a faux feminism that equated breaking down certain traditional barriers of both marriage, child care relationships, combined with the sort of sexual revolution driven by people like Hugh Hefner and Bob Guccione and these other rather low-life personalities that really um, undermined the ability to have good relationships, the ability of people to feel that they were in tune with their communities. Whether I'm right or wrong, the fact of the matter is the mental health crisis in young people today, the buck stops somewhere, and that's with us, that's with my generation and you and all of us. Talk about social media, talk about the impact of single parenting, talk about the impact of um, the 1970s you know, arc of divorce that left so many people growing up in, in homes that were not intact or reformed. Somehow this is all added up to something. And it mm -hmm. seems to me, it you're not making individual judgments of individual lives, but in total, it you know, if you were from another planet, you'd have to say, hey, these people don't particularly like children and they're not very pro-family. The elites are still getting married and sticking together. But all the stuff that came out of the propaganda about the sexual revolution combined with 1970s no-fault divorce and some, somehow this is all added up to an environment where a lot of people aren't getting married, a lot of people don't aren't having kids or they're having them very late or they're freezing their eggs because they're waiting for so long. And the whole fertility cycle and the romance cycle is out of sync. Young people saying they're not even dating anymore. Um I think as just, you know, you can't discuss child welfare apart from the social context of just family. And I don't know what's happened to the American family, but when I look at the mental health crisis in teenage kids, whatever's happened isn't good. And I wonder whether I'm just throwing a bunch of stuff out mm -hmm. there and seeing mm -hmm. if it triggers something with you and, yep. and I'd like to go there. That well, you know, there's 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 a lot there to discuss for sure. And let me start with social media, and then we'll go into the the other kind of cultural changes that you mentioned. So, I can give a kind of quick summary of of my understanding of of where the literature is on social media and youth mental health, and I'll tell you how we looked at that directly in mm -hmm. in our study. There's a a small but significant relationship between time spent using social media and mental health problems among among America's youth and youth even in other countries where these these kind of research has been done mm -hmm. it's not 
it's not huge, but it's it's there and it's notable. And then there are some there are some reasons to then then be worried about well, to what extent is this a causal relationship, and 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 to what extent is this being you know mismeasured, and then it's actually worse than than that would even suggest. Mm -hmm. And so there are a couple of issues that I think are worth worth thinking about for for your listeners when 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 kind of confronting this. One is that the issue that you mentioned uh, that the design of social media apps and websites and so on is such that they're really trying to soak as much attention and time as they can. And that's how they get, that's how they get their advertising and revenue money. They want people to stay on the app for uh, indefinitely. And they come up with clever cognitive tricks in order to accomplish that. Hmm. So there's, there's kind of reason to go in, you know, thinking that, there could be kind of an addiction problem with, with social media, given given their kind of fundamental design goals. Mm -hmm. And it turns out there's very good evidence that children and even adults spend more time on social media than they'd like to. There have been some very clever experiments by uh, some top economists that have paid people to uh, to leave social media. Um, and they've also done things like have people install apps that limit their time so they can put in a goal for how much time they want to spend on social media, say it's an hour or two hours. And then um, if they go over that, the app will shut down. And they've randomly assigned people to, to have those kinds of conditions versus you know, the, the normal, just as much as you want uh, buffet that we, that we all have now. And they see dramatic decreases in, in in use when people have those kinds of devices and tools. And then after, when the when when the when the when the treatment program ends, they stay on that kind of lower level for a time. Mm -hmm. And 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 it suggests that, uh, as as you would expect with some kind of addictive drug, um, the exposure to it kind of generates this reinforcing cycle of spending more time than, than people would like. And people say that they spend more time than they would like to on it. So uh, given that context, I think it's very reasonable to think, well, this might be a problem for, for young people who we know already have problems with, mm -hmm. with judgments and decisions and, and, and self-control. Uh, that's kind of what it means to be an adolescent is that you haven't developed uh, the, the self-control of an adult. And uh, in our in our data, we find that the average adolescent spends about five hours a day on social media apps. YouTube and TikTok are the the most prominent. And uh, to me, that's a that's a number. You know, as a parent, that's just shockingly high. Yeah. I, I can't imagine um, letting my children spend anywhere close to that amount of time, if any time. Um, yeah. My current my current oldest child is eleven. She just spends zero time on on those kinds of apps. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, I, I can recognize there are some, you know, positive uses. You you want to watch a clip of a sporting event and see the highlights. YouTube is a great place to do that. You want to, you know, you want to learn how to fix your bike. You can watch a video on YouTube and do that. You know, there are some positive uses, but how that adds up to five hours a day is beyond me. In any case, uh, there are another issue that one should be concerned about is that is raised by social psychologists uh, like Jennifer Twenge and, and Jonathan Haidt are that if a lot of kids are doing this, they're spending less time outside, they're spending less time with in-person relationships with their friends and family. And you might also think that that is a driver of mental health problems. Sure. Uh, it could lead to obesity, less physical fitness if they're you know substituting social media use for exercise and sports and that sort of thing, as well as just the quality of relationships they're going to have with their peers. If they're spending time commenting on, you know, Facebook posts, Twitter, X posts, Instagram, and so on. Uh, we all know from, if we've been on those things and I, I use X that the, uh, the quality of the discourse is low to say the least. Uh, sure. and, and often biting, sarcastic, not elevating, not edifying, uh, not the sort of, uh, you know, it, it's not like reading classical literature <laughs> or you feel like yeah. you've learned something, you've absorbed something productive about human nature and life, and, and, and you've got some insight on how to be a better person. It's, it's very much the opposite of that seems to be this, this sort of standard uh, for those engagements. Yeah. 
so those are all kind of concerns that I had going into into this. And then our own study, sure enough, kind of replicated this mm. finding that higher amounts of time spent on social media is associated with with worse mental health, lower levels mm. of thriving and well-being. And the the only twist that I would offer to your listeners uh, that I think is a, a distinct interpretation that we've been able mm. to come up with in our data is is that the the role of parenting matters a lot here and uh, in two ways. One, we asked parents whether they regulate social media use at all and a kind of surprisingly high number said that they really didn't. Um, but then the other part of it is the, the, the teen reported much higher social media use when their parents didn't restrict and much lower when they did. And, the, and then if you look at the relationship with the parents overall, Mm -hmm. uh, if if the youth reported a strong, supportive, loving relationship, and the parent reporting restricting restricting social media use, uh, you didn't really see any of that those addiction problems. Um, yeah, and and I think there you can kind of intuitively think the parent in that case the parent is setting rules, but they have a good relationship, so the the child is not trying to undermine or circumvent those rules by kind of using it. Uh, when the parents not paying attention, or mm. you know, maybe you know, staying up late in their bedroom and using it, or using it when they're not supervised. We also asked how much time the the child spends unsupervised on a daily basis, mm. and that predicted more social media use, as you might guess. So, so basically, we found that if the 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 child parent relationship is strong, the 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 parent is has rules on social media use, and is not leaving the child unsupervised for long periods of time after school, there's not really a, a mental health problem related sure. to social media use. Uh, and, and, and that seems to be the way to escape that problem. It's not, it's not easy. A lot of parents are busy. They don't have, they can't always be there to supervise. Uh, having, you know, forging a high quality relationship requires the sort of parenting that we talked about uh, just mm. a few minutes ago. And, um, and of course, you know, having to me, the one that's most intuitive is that you have to have rules. You can't just expect teenagers to navigate this completely bizarre new world on their own. That's right. Yeah. And it's interesting thinking back to car use in the day before there were iPhones and so forth. Teenagers were learning to drive in the 40s and the 50s and so on. But the use of the family car was pretty regulated. You didn't just hand them the keys and say whatever you want. Um, you know, there's danger involved, there's responsibility, there's time, there's when are you going to sleep. And that level has not translated to the use of social media, except with the parents you're talking about, where there's this good effect of setting some boundaries. And then you see that, um, you know, the repercussion being less mental health issues at all. Uh, Jennifer, uh, Twing, Twingy, Twingy, how do you say her last name? I think maybe Twenchy. Yeah, Twenchy. I've been trying to figure it out. I'm going to interview her at some point soon, and then I'll ask her how you say her name. And then I'll... <laughs> <laughs> but, I, you know, she wrote this very interesting book that I've read on iGen, and one of the things she talks about is the fragility of the younger people she interviewed and their inability to carry on a discussion in which someone is disagreeing with them without getting upset. So what's funny to me is, is whatever this social media exposure has been, has been similar for young people. Is it for adults, you know, um, those, those algorithms, which keep you hooked also channel you. So you're always hearing things more and more and more zeroing in on what your interests already are, or your politics already is, or your views already are. And that's one of the aspects in her book. Um, that was interesting to me about the younger people, Generation Z, whatever you want to call them. She calls them the iGen uh, generation. Um, and I'm wondering if anything in your studies uh, and your surveys and the Gallup polling and the way you've interpreted it also with your background in, in psychology sheds any light on the, you know, what is loosely called cancel culture, which is a kind of a political term, but then with her views of just kind of the fragility of people. Would you think that with a good parental relationship of the strong bond combined with the, the discipline setting of um, parameters that are good for the mental health of the child, that that would also apply 
to young people in giving them the confidence to have a discussion with someone that might disagree vehemently without either shouting them down or getting upset or leaving. Uh, just that ability to interact socially. Does anything you've been studying shed any light on that? Or is that just this old 71-year-old being me harping about, quote, the younger people? Uh, or is there a really thing, is there really something there in terms of an inability to um to just carry on public discourse in a way that you don't take it personally? You know, mm -hmm. like we're discussing here, we could be disagreeing, but neither of us are gonna leave the room and get upset. Um Jean Twingy is her name, not Jen. No, Jean, yeah. That might have been my I might have said Jennifer. But I think she does great work um in any case. So to answer your question, I do think that the the quality of parenting, the practices that the the warmth combined with the discipline have a side effect mm. besides just improving the quality of the relationship that is is essentially building the character of of the child. And one of the most important character traits, it's it's one of the cardinal virtues that were talked about uh, in the ancient world and uh, remains uh, you know, one that is emphasized in, in even today's Catholic Church is, is self-control, temperance. Mm -hmm. And first of all, that's directly relevant to social media use. We found that we, we tried it, we, we measured self-control in a couple of different ways. One is through one of the big five personality traits, conscientiousness. And another is, uh, you know, kind of par parents reports on the degree of control that their child uh, exhibits. Yeah. And we also asked children kind of an indirect question um, about the frequency of their, their vegetable eating habits, yeah, yeah. whether they eat vegetables every day. It's kind of another uh, you know, indicator of self-control in a way, because insofar as vegetables don't taste good, you eat them anyway mm -hmm. because you know that they're healthy. Uh, that suggests that you know, you, you're willing to put, put aside uh, temporary fleeting pleasures for mm -hmm. uh, long-run uh, gains and benefits. And we found that kids who exhibited more self-control using any of those measures were spending less time on social media. Mm -hmm. And also, they're more apt to have the parents who are, are, are doing that warm, disciplined parenting. And I think it's intuitive as to why discipline would, would create self-control. I mean, we kind of see that with trainers, coaches, and so on. They're, they're really kind of, in, they're in, you know, militaries. I mean, it's so, so clear in those situations where they're asking people to go well beyond their comfort level mm. and, and, and instilling them with the motivation and the, the character to, 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 to do that. And when it comes to, to parents, every time you set limits on your kids, you're, you're appealing to a higher authority, your own authority, perhaps, yeah. or the authority that you bring from the traditions, ancestors that you're representing, uh, the philosophy that you're representing, uh, which is presumably rooted in something much larger than yourself. You're bringing that authority to the rule, to the enforcement, and you're asking the child to uh, adopt and internalize that authority, and you're helping him or her do that. Yeah. And, and that authority, once internalized, can prevent them from doing bad things or or, or limit the extent mm -hmm. to which they're you know doing harmful things to themselves and i and i also think it it can give them the the courage other than cardinal virtues to to confront disagreements mm -hmm. more more civilly and if they've got the uh, strong attachment to their parents they're they're coming from an, an anti-fragile foundation mm -hmm. where they're not going to be their sense of self their coherence their, their identity is not going to be put at risk by what other people say on social media they're not going to care as much about what strangers think they're not going to be their heart isn't going to be racing if they see like you know based on the number of likes on on their their posts to the extent to which someone else may be very dependent on on that i mean this is temptation we all face that we all want yeah. we all want to be loved by the crowd we all want uh you know more likes more hearts whatever it happens to be uh but but people who have that stronger foundation put less weight on it and are able to maintain their uh their life path, their their 
their their sense of balance. They're are able to move on to a much greater extent. And I think that's uh, part of what Jen Twinji's work is, is kind of uncovering this fact that we've lost a bit of that robustness, perhaps. And mm. uh, you know, we can argue about why. I think some of the reasons that you alluded to earlier could be could be behind it. Mm. Yeah, you know, there's a bunch of books that I've been reading in preparation for this project of my podcast, and a lot of them have a kind of a cross section where they, for different reasons, come to similar conclusions. And I would just say, in terms of what you're saying today, it's a thread that is running through a lot of things in, in unexpected places. A book I mentioned quite a bit is The Old Way the story of the first people by Elizabeth Marshall Thomas, who in the 1950s, her dad co-founded Raytheon. Um, she's in her 90s now. Her father must have been quite an interesting character because he took her and her mother, who was an anthropologist, and they just took off for the Kalahari Desert and lived there for over a year with a small group of, of uh, what some people call the Bushmen or you know the San people, the hunter-gatherers. And they were the first exposure, this group they were with, had ever had to anyone from the outside at all, mm -hmm. uh, which just seems amazing that you could find people even in the 1950s like that, but they mm -hmm. were truly isolated. But what's interesting to me about what Elizabeth uh, Thomas and her parents observed and her mother's writing on the subject and Elizabeth Thomas writing in quoting her mother in this in phenomenal book, by the way, um, perhaps one of the best books I've ever read, really changed the way I saw things because we tend to talk about um, you know, women's rights or the balance in marriage and child-parent relationships in terms of, you know, we look back at the old-fashioned model and then we look at the present day and we make a comparison. But she was with a group of people whose life had not changed substantially. Literally, that group, this group of people in the Kalahari had been living in much the same way for 80,000, not eight, 80,000 years so with a direct connection to our evolutionary deep past. Um, and one of the things she found is the quality of their parenting and the way the whole community pulled together and the equality of involvement with males and females. And remember, they were in the 1950s. This is pre-modern feminism. She's not, she wasn't making notes based on trying to make something, you know, make a point. They were just observing. And what really strikes me about that is that, you know, in our human family, we have a pattern in the hunter-gatherer cultures that are pre-modern, pre-religion, uh, pre-politics as we understand it. But there, there, there is a basic way of doing things. There is such a thing as normal. And I don't look for that in the 14th century in Europe or, you know, Edward III or James I or whomever. I look for it in the hunter-gatherers that Thomas and her family study. This is the beginnings of us. And what's strange is that all the social pathologies you've sort of studied by default, by looking at what works best, um, this particular group that she was with did not have. Children were cared for. Women were treated as equal members. If a young person didn't know something, the, the phrase they always use is, the old people haven't told me yet. There sure. was a the old people were around because they knew things and that helped you survive. And I was just so struck by her book um, at the fact that we have this kind of pride of modernity and development as if we've learned something. And actually the best childcare book I've ever read is The Old Way by Elizabeth Marshall Thomas, by extension of saying, oh, well, look what the sand people did for 80,000 years. They survived because of the way they behaved. And the emphasis was on parenting and community, duh. You know, I mean, this has been going for a while. So it just, sorry to go on, but it strikes me that so much of what you're finding in Gallup is not new. It confirms what we've always known. And I just want you to think about that a little bit and help talk talk to talk to me in terms of your views on that. Well, I, I, I think that's, I think that's true fundamentally. Uh, you know, I, I, as I've come, I, I don't know at what point. I mean, I, first of all, I've always had a great interest in in the hunter gatherer communities, and ever since I learned as an undergraduate um, that twenty years ago that um, roughly ninety nine percent of human existence was living in those kinds of communities, hmm. uh, it ma it makes very much intuitive sense to me 
that our our fundamental human nature was shaped by those that lifestyle mm. and we are probably jeopardizing our mental or physical health at least to some extent yeah. if we go too far from if we stray too far from that and and that that has all sorts of implications for for daily life in terms of spending too much time sitting too much time in front of the screens mm. uh, but also how we relate relate to one another and 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 this idea that you know we're we're, we're if we go on social media we're going to be part of a community of yeah 100 million people you know millions of people that's uh you know probably going to be hard to manage uh the the quality of those relationships compared to a tribe where you you know the history of every individual there you know their 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 mother and their father their grandparents mm-hmm. their great grandparents and you know their character and you know their their strengths and their weaknesses and you're not making assumptions that vilify them and assume that they're psychopaths because they endorsed a politician or or yeah. uh, they you know said that they liked a newspaper article mm-hmm. uh, one thing that just leaps from the page in in her book and by the way i do highly recommend that it's she's a tremendous writer and it's a wonderful read but it was about 15 or 20 years ago that she wrote this book it's not new but it's fabulous um is the intergenerational connection that they took for normal there was no mm-hmm. young people go do this old people were off in a corner you know, everybody was there. And when you quit being able to walk, you waited at the camp until the people going out looking for the ground nuts or hunting came back and they shared with you. That was the way it went. Um, But it was intergenerational. So kids were not being raised by simply the parent, the grandparent Mm -hmm. was there, the parent-in-law was there, the uncle was there. And, and, you know, everybody participated in this process. Um, and I think we've lost that intergenerational quali- quality. And of course, iPhones and all these little fake communities that we've gravitated to cut off the intergenerational aspect even more. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, I think, I don't know whether we were on air, so to speak, but just that, you know, the great treasure of my life is living across the street from three of my five grandchildren. And that relationship is, I think, literally the thing that I enjoy most in life right now at age 71 of anything. Um, it's fabulous. It's why I get up in the morning and, you know, I'm needed, you know, Mm -hmm. my, my granddaughter, my 15 year old had a migraine headache. I drove down and picked her up at her high school, 45 minutes, brought her back, cooked her lunch, made sure she had some ibuprofen. And, you know, I knew why I got up that morning and you Mm -hmm. extend that to all these old people sitting in isolation. Mm -hmm. It's a, that's a tragedy right there. Aside from mental health of young people. Yes. I, I completely agree. Uh, my father-in-law, his his wife passed away. I think would probably be in a uh, devastatingly sad state if not for the fact that he lives very close to his uh, two of his grandchildren and mm. has been involved in having them over every day, picking them up after school, like you're describing. And I think that's been a. There's no doubt that that's been a tremendous boost to his mental health and sense of belonging and purpose. Yeah, and that's something that yeah you know, I think. Is it's tragic how much that has uh, dissipated uh, in our in our modern culture. My only hope is that, uh, as so many people were driven to big cities uh, for professional jobs, myself included, living in here in Washington D.C., which is not where I grew up. Uh, the the only thing that gives me hope on this is that now that we've all decided that we can work remotely, if you're in one of those kinds of professional jobs. Yeah. It gives people the freedom to to go back to wherever they came from and and not all be clustered together in the skyscrapers and the the mega cities. Well, and maybe and, not move nine times for your career, which is the average and the American average, or it was last time there was a study of it, which is just crazy. How's anybody going to have a community when you just keep popping around all over the place? Exactly. I mean that that's very much yeah you know, part of the problem. Uh, people move for economic opportunity and that. And that and now the whole world is is available. Uh, and you know, there's no uh, cer- certainly uh, the entire United States for, for for anyone who who goes off to college and aspires to you know have some kind of professional career. Where it... so yeah. I, I think those are all all sort of ailments that that we're we're wrestling with. 
Let me finish with one thing that I know you've observed, even if it's tangentially through other studies, and that is this sort of career workism that we've fallen into where we're not really interested in who someone is, really just what they do. And we judge our own trajectory that way too. You know, we, a college kid saying, well, I can't afford to fall in love now. I haven't gotten my master's degree yet, or, you know, delay in childbearing because we've got to do this project first. These sort of these weird modern standards we set that get in the way of everything from romance to starting family, but also just this idea that jobs define us. And in terms of the parenting you were talking about, you know, it would seem to me those parents who had found that balance of, of childcare with discipline and love and connection, maybe they have given thought or haven't, or it's just a tradition they grew up with. But I would imagine that they don't see themselves primarily as fill in the blank doctor, lawyer, plumber, electrician, garbage collector, waiter, uh, you know, economist, whatever <laughs> it may be. Talk, talk a little bit about that and before we wrap out here, because I think your work directly impacts how we see ourselves and what we value in this culture. And it seems to me it's career all the way down and very, very little to do with the things that actually make us find joy in our lives. Well, I think that's part of the, the cultural trend that, that you referenced earlier that uh, sort of arose maybe in the second half of the 20th century uh, or maybe came, you know, kind of came stronger and gained strength uh, from, from that point on. In part for reasons that are sort of understandable with increased urbanization, increased educational opportunities. Uh, but what 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 I find in in some research that we've done on on we do a lot of research on well being here at Gallup, mm -hmm. and uh, including satisfaction with jobs and and how you rate the quality of your work. Some of the the, the less intuitive findings are that people's sense of their job quality really plummets if they start working more than 43, 44, 45 hours a week. Mm -hmm. And you can really plot that it, it kind of peaks around between sort of 35 and 40 and then and really starts to tail off after that. And, mm -hmm. and that's true even if you're making a great salary and income. And when it comes to, to parenting, it's, it becomes very obvious that there's the, there's sort of that trade off where every hour that you're investing in, you know, back in your professional identity is is an hour less for your spouse, for your children, for your mm -hmm. community, for your friends, and I, I I would like us to get back to a, a point where uh, those things are given greater weight and mm -hmm. uh, employers recognize that that's part of having a well balanced life and 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 to retain the the most talented productive employees are going to have to you know carve out space for that and uh certainly when it comes to to parenting there's just there's no it seems to me there's no shortcut i mean to be that warm responsive parent you have to be there you have to show up you have to yeah uh you have to you, to, to discipline you have to be there you have to show up it's very hard to discipline remotely uh it's hard to communicate your your orders and commands from uh you know, a, a zoom call uh if you're you know, in a hotel room across the country or something but the uh is, going back to your point about that none of this is new uh you i remember you know in in writing a, a book that i put out in 2019 i read a, a, as much plato as i could and i was amused at his descriptions of, of some of the the prominent rulers of his day, mm -hmm. uh, Xerxes and uh, some of the, the great Persian emperors. And he would often have the comment about their son, uh, who never lived up to the father's reputation, mm -hmm. that the, he, he was taught in a way that was uh, too permissive and too uh, basically spoiled and didn't have the kind of disciplined, attentive parenting that the that the great emperor had. And uh, it, it's just amusing to think that even, you know, 2000, 4,000 years ago, um, you know, uh, thoughtful people were, were, were sort of explaining, you know, the trajectory of, of, of famous people based on, mm. on, on what was happening with their parenting and, and, and the, and being a successful 
individual and being an outstanding contributor to politically or or mm-hmm. through science or 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 entertainment uh, doesn't mean that you're going to be good at at other important aspects of life such as parenting your own children and mm-hmm. uh there's some real there are some real trade-offs there uh that i think we could all do do well to keep in mind well listen let me ask you uh, as we wrap this out um if we will link to whatever Ernie, uh, my producer, will link to whatever you want people to link to in terms of getting in touch with you or following your work. Uh, any, any suggestions off the top of your head in terms of things you've written in the past that someone might want to dig into, book or article or anything else uh, that we can post? But um, just you know, before we wrap up here, um, anything that you would like to mention in regard to, to letting people know about it? Well... On our on Gallup's webpage, we have we have Gallup.com, which is kind of our our general webpage. We have news.gallup.com, and and kind of that's that's where we publish mm-hmm. regular information from uh, various survey work. We're going to be creating a web page that we'll, we'll we'll hopefully have up in a few days. That's going to host uh, a number of studies that we've done using these mm-hmm. this parenting data, and so there are about five publications or so right now. Two of which were with uh, Brad Wilcox's Institute for Family Studies. So I'm glad you're having him on the program. Yeah, we're having Brad on in a couple of weeks. <laughs> and uh, so that you know will give readers uh, plenty of information on on the work that we're doing now and that we hope to continue to do over the next year or two at least. Mm-hmm. And then uh, yeah, in terms of, of book recommendations, I, I I suppose I'd be remiss not to mention my own and that came out in 2019. Yep. Which is called so Republic of Equals. So Republic that that book, Equals, yeah, yeah, uh, that that came out from Princeton University Press. I'd say it was on a, uh, a rather different topic. Uh, my attempt to explain why income inequality is so high in the United States relative to other countries, and uh, basically get at sort of the fundamental issues in in how to think about the income distribution. One of I'd which like, I'd is, like to read that myself. Yeah, go ahead. And and I'm just saying, er, Ernie, our producer will be hearing this, and that's not all that long ago. Um, I'll get Republic of Equals read it and have you back to talk about that because that's a whole other area that I have a tremendous amount of interest in and in income equal inequality. But you were going to say something about that. Well, yeah, I kind of break it down into uh, you know a couple different pieces. One is access to to markets and access mm-hmm. to to public resources and public goods, and uh, I think one of the less intuitive arguments that I make is you know, markets inherently don't generate the kind of extreme income inequality that we see in the United States today hmm. without interference by uh, either government regulations or trade associations and groups that have distorted things to their own advantage, allowing hmm. them to take in more revenue than than a more competitive process would allow. And and that kind of goes back uh, kind of goes back to those those hunter gatherer studies when the anthropologists have looked at the the distribution of wealth and assets in those hunter gatherer communities they find it's comparable to modern day Denmark mm-hmm. in, in other words not not completely equal there were differences and you know sure. uh, sometimes tangible and intangible goods and resources but they were uh, they tended to you know, maybe people who are contributing a little bit more, they were slightly better hunters or gatherers would have a little bit more resources. But what checked that is that the distribution of human talent wasn't hugely different when it comes to some of those you know, basic things about being productive. And I think that's still the case today. And I provide some evidence uh, on that. And um, not not that there aren't great entertainers or entrepreneurs that in my opinion deserve to be rich it's fine they've they've created something that a lot of people mm-hmm. enjoy and you know but that's that's a very small slice mm-hmm. of 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 who we could consider rich people yeah. there are a lot more people who um who get there providing more basic goods and services like legal services or medical services mm-hmm. uh, where you could say they deserve to be affluent and enjoy a high standard of living but uh because of the rules and regulations on who can compete with them and under what circumstances, mm-hmm. they're able to charge much higher prices. They're able to enjoy what economists call rents or sort of excess profit sure. revenues. Um, 
And so that's part of it. And then the other part of the story is 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 looking at you know kind of the quality of opportunity with respect to getting access to high quality schools, neighborhoods, and conditions that have particularly affected the black community here in the United States. And so that's that's those are the sort of the main themes that the book deals with. Well, good, because we'll have you back and do the book. Um, that'll be great. So we're, we'll bring you back if you'll if you're if you'll do a re- second round of this with me, and we'll do a Republic of Equals um, uh, discussion. And in the meantime, thank you so much because I just find these these I love. I don't know. I'm, I'm sure it's to do with you. I mean, the way you, Gallup is zeroing in on these questions of family and context and what works and how social media is impacting people and what good parenting is. I see this quoted everywhere. People respect you greatly from all walks of life and many, many different political stripes. So you're really doing something great. And um, it's been a real privilege to have you on, Jonathan. So thank you for your time and all the best with the new baby when that child comes along. Safety and happiness to all of you. (laughs) Lovely talking with you. Likewise, Frank. Really appreciate the opportunity. Take care. Really fun. See you again, I hope, soon on Republic of Equals. That'd be great. Yep. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.